How can we press in to receive more fellowship, more communion, to be deeper in the presence of God? So, Pastor Joe, if you've cleared out all the roadblocks, now let's press on into the holiest of all by God's grace. So we want to study this subject, Waiting on God. From the scripture 27, verse 14, if you've got your notes, where David said, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And we want to learn, uh, we'll be teaching specifically what it is for us to individually spend, uh, spend time separated unto God, time where we are seeking the Lord in waiting on His presence, whether it's as an individual or together as a group. But in your notes, the second paragraph, the Christian life should be a progression of spiritual growth and development. In the Psalms we read, we are to go from strength to strength, from company to company, until we all appear before God in Zion. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, that we are to go from one level of glory to higher levels of glory as we behold the Lord, as we're transformed by His Spirit. But an important pathway into growing more into the image and likeness of Christ is when we learn to spend times waiting on the Lord, waiting in His presence, seeking a closer communion. And this is not when we are seeking God for an answer to a specific prayer, which of course we know is very important. It's not when we're seeking God for a revelation from His Word or studying His Word, which is important. It's not when we're seeking God for, for guidance or direction, which we need to do at times. But what we're going to study and what specifically we are meaning here in waiting on God is that we are simply seeking to draw deeper into God's manifested presence. We know God is everywhere, but that does not mean that He reveals His presence everywhere. And so when God wants to manifest His presence, when we want to sense the presence of God, the Spirit of God within our heart or within a group of people, then we are seeking for more of God's presence to be revealed. That His Spirit will be thicker or deeper. Or as the word in the Hebrew for glory is kabod, it is weighty. We want to feel the presence of God stronger and stronger, weightier and heavier upon us as we seek for more of God's Spirit as we want to come closer to the Lord. And so we want to learn how to come into times of deeper communion with the Lord by His Spirit meeting with our heart or our spirit. Paragraph 3 in your notes. Times when believers seek to draw nearer to God and receive more of His manifested presence sinking into us can be called times of waiting on God the title of what we're teaching now, or modern groups sometimes call it soaking in the Spirit, like a thirsty sponge. We want to soak in more of God's presence. We want to spend time just receiving more of the anointing. As Sister, uh, Sister Nanette prophesied, uh, was that that we would be reservoirs, God wants to fill us that we will be reservoirs of His Holy Spirit. We want to be soaked, drenched, filled with His Spirit. As when the Lord told the prophet Samuel, fill your horn with oil. That we need to gain an abiding anointing within us. That we can, first of all, be closer to the Lord, but also have an anointing with which we can pour out to others, minister to others. And some 
people and some books have titled this having communion with God to be practicing God's presence. So whatever title we give it, learning to practice being in God's presence or soaking in more of the Spirit of God, letting ourselves be uh, uh, soaked and filled, anointed with fresh oil. David wrote, anoint me with fresh oil, or modern terminology, well, fill our reservoir, Lord. <laughs> or waiting on God that we will draw nearer to him into more and more of his manifested presence and power and glory. In the next paragraph, King David was called in Acts 13, 22, a man after God's own heart. And we study in Psalm 27, what he said was the main focus of his life, what certainly helped focus him in to qualifying to be commended by God as a man after God's own heart. When he wrote in Psalm 27, verse 4, one thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. And when we seek to do what David continually did, seek the Lord in his temple, in his holy place, in his presence, wait upon him and behold his beauty, sense more and more of a revelation of God with us and God soaking into us, filling the vessel of our heart, filling us to be a reservoir of his spirit, of his anointing, that we will abide close to the Lord and have an anointing to be effective, releasing ministry to others. Now, when we spend time in God's presence, in the notes, seeking to enter deeper into communion and union with him, there are many scriptures that help teach this to us, the pathway into God's presence, the way that we can get closer and closer to God and feel more and more of his presence, not just around us, but soaking deeper and deeper into our heart, into our being, transforming us from one level of glory to higher levels of having God's presence and glory within us. And so let's look at our first scriptural uh, uh, imagery that teaches this to us in Psalm or in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, a scripture most of us know very well. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31 in the New King James, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And here as it's talking about waiting on the Lord, spending time in God's presence, seeking more of God to be revealed to us and into us, then it says... As we wait on the Lord, our strength is renewed. That word can also be translated, our strength is exchanged. Where we, instead of using our strength, which is weak and inadequate to accomplish the work of God, instead, that is exchanged for the strength of God. That we will decrease and He will increase. And it says that as we wait on the Lord that we will mount up with wings like eagles. And so it's important for us to understand how eagles rise high into the sky, higher than any other animal or bird. We all know that there are many kinds of birds that fly many different ways. For a moment, let's consider someone with chicken wings. I don't mean from Kentucky Fried Chicken. I mean, if spiritually speaking, we can fly like a chicken. Can a chicken fly? Yes, but not very well. And can he fly very high? Not very high. But the chicken who is basically involved in life 
of just looking to the ground, minding earthly things, looking for a tasty little worm. <laughs> if a dog comes up that wants to attack it and the chicken sees it, the chicken will start furiously flapping his wings. <laughs> And he might get a meter or two up into the tree, totally exhausted, because the chicken has to flap his wings very hard to get, to get any altitude to fly at all. But the Bible doesn't say that those that wait on the Lord will rise up like with chicken wings. Okay? That could be likened to an immature Christian. That when not a dog, but maybe an evil spirit comes along, and you're, and, and, oh, an evil spirit, oh, I rebuke you, I rebuke you, you know, and, and half an hour later, I'm a meter high in the spirit, I, I'm above the enemy. Sometimes it's a lot of work to uh, fly up in the spirit above our enemies, above our troubles, especially for a young Christian, it might be a lot of effort. It might take a lot of time, a lot of flapping of wings. But an eagle does not fly like a chicken. An eagle will be abiding up on a mountaintop or the top of a tree. And then it will jump off and will begin to glide, maybe flap its wings once or twice. But an eagle glides. And as he glides, he is seeking to discern which way the wind is blowing. And when he senses how the wind is blowing and he turns himself into the wind, the wind will lift him up and he'll soar and then he'll turn back into the wind and the wind will lift him higher. And as he turns into the face of the wind, he will go higher and higher and higher, not by his own effort, but by the power of the blowing of the wind. And this is a spiritual lesson that the Lord wants to teach us in our spiritual life. That Jesus said in John 3, 8, that the wind blows where it will. It's like the blowing of the Holy Spirit. And God's Spirit is always moving in the earth, but we often do not discern it. But as we're sensitive to the Lord, as we're waiting on the Lord, as we're looking for his presence, then we will start to discern the manifestation of the spirit, the blowing of the wind. And when we sense how God is beginning to reveal his presence, how the wind is starting to blow, and we turn our heart into the blowing of the wind of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes into our heart and lifts us higher. And then maybe we're distracted, and then a minute later, oh, oh yes, the presence of God. And if we turn our heart back into the presence of the Lord, and we feel God revealing more of his presence into our heart, the blowing of the wind lifts us higher and higher. Not by our uh, shouting loud, blah, 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 blah. not by our flapping chicken wings to try to get more spiritual and work so hard. No. Just looking for the blowing of the wind to come stronger and stronger within our hearts. Now, do we feel that the revealed presence of God is among us? And don't you love just opening up your heart in times when God's presence is, 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 is strong, is thick? Don't you just opening up your heart, love opening up your heart and just feeling more of the anointing flowing in more and more? We can just soak in more of God's presence as we are here, having worshipped, opened our hearts. But as we open our hearts and turn our hearts into the blowing, the revealing, the moving of the Spirit, that is like the wind that lifts the eagle higher and higher. That we do not become lifted into heavenly places by our own works, by our shouting and screaming and trying very hard to be spiritual. No, not by might, not by our power, not by our shouting or shaking or doing something, 
but looking to God with our hearts open. And by God's Spirit, God is doing a work, lifting us higher and higher into His presence. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, a few years ago, my wife and I and Sister Set were uh, having breakfast one morning, and Sister Set said, look, look at that bird over there. And right at the edge of the property here, we saw an eagle starting to fly. And he was just above the treetops when we first saw him. But as he circled around and circled around, within about two minutes, he was just a tiny little pinpoint high in the sky. Got out the binoculars and checked out what kind of eagle it was. It was a, an eagle. But it soared up so quickly. And in another time, I saw, saw an eagle just soar up so quick here from this property because there are places, naturally speaking, that are conducive, that are easy to have updrafts of wind. And here, if you've ever looked over the veranda, we've got a deep valley right below us on the east side of this property. And when the wind is blowing that way, there is a strong updraft that birds enjoy. It, sometimes it blows uh, multitudes of insects up. And you'll see in the morning uh, hundreds and hundreds of birds going around eating their breakfast because the wind lifted the insects up above the trees. Well, we've seen the eagles flying high here because this location in the natural has a strong updraft to blow the wind higher and higher for the eagles to enjoy. And in the spirit, I believe God has this place to have a strong updraft and uplifting of God's presence, of the blowing of the Holy Spirit, that if we will wait on the Lord and turn our hearts into the blowing of the Holy Spirit, that this is a place God wants to lift us higher and higher into his presence. Hallelujah. Amen. So enjoy yourself here. Use your time and, and enjoy learning how to use eagle's wings to draw closer and closer, stronger and stronger into God's wonderful presence. So that is one imagery from the Bible, how we can wait upon the Lord and gain exchange strength that it's not by our might or power, not by our flapping our chicken wings that we can fly and be spiritual, but by waiting on the Lord and the blowing of the wind of the Spirit by God's work and power, we are lifted higher and higher as we wait on the Lord and gain wings like eagles. Now, a second imagery in the Bible that also teaches us how to enter deeper into God's presence is Moses' tabernacle. And most of you have not just studied lessons on this, but you probably also taught them. But we want to just very quickly look at the basic pattern shown to us in Moses' tabernacle on the way in to the very manifested power and glory of God. We all know that Moses' tabernacle had three sections to it. The outer court, where all of God's people were invited in, and then a second place, the holy place, that the priests were able to enter into. And then the place where God dwelt in his power and glory, this secret place of the Most High, the Holy of Holies, only the high priest could enter into one time a year. But when you look at the workings of man and what they were to do to serve God in these three sections of Moses' tabernacle, in the outer court, the place all of God's people could come, it was a place where there was a lot of heavy physical work in serving God. There were the priests that carried in the buckets of water to fill the huge brass labor that they would wash in. There were the servants that brought in all of the loads of heavy wood because they burned much wood on the altar. Then there were the priests that had to take the animals how, uh, there were times when uh, a thousand oxen or cow were slaughtered 
for a great festival? How would you like to be one of the priests that had to chop up a thousand cows? Chop up the legs, cut off the legs, drag the leg up to the altar, put it on the fire, okay, go chop up another leg, put it on, and, and cut up the head, and, and put it on the fire. Again and again and again, day after day. No wonder they needed the washing of the water <laughs> after all that work and all of that blood. It was a lot of strenuous physical labor to serve God in the outer court, the outer court where all of God's people were invited in to meet with God. But then, if you were a priest of the Lord, you could be invited in closer to God in the holy place. And the priests that entered the holy place had much more delicate works of ministry. It was light physical labor. They went in to the golden candlestick and with little scissors they trimmed the wicks, just cut off the burnt dead part of the wick. That's not very hard. They'd go over to the altar of incense. They'd sprinkle a little more incense on. Once a day, they'd go to the altar, uh, the table of showbread, and they'd replace the loaves of bread with fresh bread. Not, not a lot of physical effort. Very easy, light work. But then, when someone was allowed into the Holy of Holies, the only thing that happened there in the workings of man was once a year, the Jewish high priest was allowed to go in holding the incense before him, and he went in and he sprinkled a little bit of blood on the mercy seat at the Ark of the Covenant. And that's the only work of man done once every year. Just and then the high priest would depart. A lot of physical labor chopping up the sacrifices, burning them with the wood and the fire and the, and the washing of the water. The outer court was a lot of human work and activity getting closer to God in the holy place. It was much more refined, delicate ministry. Sprinkle, sprinkle, sprinkle. Very light work. But then in the Holy of Holies, 364 days of the year, there was no workings of man. But it was in the Holy of Holies that God was at work the most. In the outer court, God forgave sins. In the holy place, he revealed his light by the golden candlestick. He had the hidden manna at the table of showbread. But God worked the most powerfully in the Holy of Holies. And in your notes, God's works in the Holy of Holies included that that was the place where God revealed his glory. Psalm 80 verse 1 says, You who dwell between the cherubim, shine forth. God revealed his glory from the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. And Exodus 25, 22 and other scriptures spoke about how from the mercy seat in the center of the ark, there in the Holy of Holies, it says, God said, there I will meet with you and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony. When the high priest went into the Holy of Holies, he didn't speak anything. But God was the one that was speaking in the Holy of Holies. God was the one revealing his power and his glory, his manifested light, the Shekinah, glory of God. And it was there, according to Leviticus 16, that God forgave, nationally forgave, the sins of all of his people and where he would arise to show his power. So in the outer court, man works hard and God blesses. Getting closer to God, 
Man's works are much, much less, and God is more active with the hidden manna, with the light of the golden candlestick, with God moving there. But in the Holy of Holies, there was almost no working of man, but there was the full working of God. And so we want to learn how to draw closer and closer into God's presence. And when we're out in the outer court, we might be working hard, praying, and, 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 and praising the Lord and trying to break through into God's presence. But then when you're in the holy place, the hidden manna is there. It's easier to see the wonderful things of God from the scriptures. There, the light of the golden candlestick is revealing not seven lamps of fire, but the seven anointings of the spirits of God. But when you go into the Holy of Holies, then the full power of God is active, and man does almost nothing. And when the priests would stand there, it could be like the scripture said, be still and know that I am God. And like from Zechar Zechariah, be silent all flesh before the Lord, for he is arising from his holy habitation. So Moses' tabernacle shows us that as we get closer and closer to God, there will be less of our striving, less of our struggles and works, and more and more of the working of God. And we can even see this at times in our worship services. When people begin worship services, the Bible says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Maybe we start with a prayer of thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. And we'll be praising the Lord, we'll be lively, we'll be rejoicing. But then when you enter into the inner court, you shift from praise to worship. And you're no longer so much involved with the physical, it's more gentle in the worship and if you enter deeply into God's presence there's less and less of our striving of our pumping ourselves oh, give me a J what's that give me an E oh, what's that give me an S okay that might be in the outer court it's not in the Holy of Holies okay you might have a very lively drummer encouraging everybody out in the outer court. And not overpowering, please, but, you know, lively, full of life. But when you get into the Holy of Holies, where all flesh is silent before the Lord as he starts to reveal his glory and power, musically speaking, if you get into the Holy of Holies, which isn't very often, but if you do, that's not the time for a drum solo. Okay? No. That's time to behold the beauty of the Lord. To be silent before the glory of God. And so we want to learn how to enter deeper and deeper into God's presence by the imagery of Moses' tabernacle. Eagle Wings teaches us how to turn our heart into the moving of the Holy Spirit. Moses' tabernacle teaches us many wonderful truths of how we can draw nearer and nearer into God's manifested power and glory. And we want, if possible, not just to be rejoicing saints in the outer court, happy, jumping, shouting, which is great in the proper time and way. But we want to go from praise into worship to where God is revealing his presence. And if we get into the Holy of Holies, God will be revealing his glory. And God in these last days wants to reveal his glory upon and through his people. Do we all agree we are in the last days? And do we all know in the last days things are going to get worse before they get better? <laughs> right? 
Jesus is coming and will make all things well. But before then, as we heard yesterday, there will be the great tribulation. There will be increasing trouble. God will shake the, 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 everything that can be shaken, the nations. And Isaiah 60 verse 1 tells us that deep darkness will come upon the people. But as darkness and sin and troubles increasing in the world, this is the time when God wants his church to arise and shine and have the glory of the Lord rise upon us. And how do we have the glory of the Lord rise upon us? We need to get into the Holy of Holies where the glory of God is revealed. And as we learn the pathway into God's more and more powerful presence, we will start to gain more and more glimpses of God's glory and His power. Amen? Amen. Six times in my uh, 45 years, uh, 46 years of, of following the Lord, six times I have visibly seen God's manifested Shekinah glory as, as visible light and power. And the last time was last October when uh, my wife and I and Pastor Dick and others were uh, in New Zealand ministering. And there were some times when there were clear moves of the Spirit in uh, church situations, a uh, Bible school, and to, to pastors that were very spiritually dry. New Zealand right now, the parts that we saw, is in a very spiritually dry period of time. And so as we brought uh, and saw the move of the Spirit, it was refreshing, and pastors and, and people were touched by the Lord. But then, I think it was our last evening there, I had an experience where a number of us were on a mountaintop, a solid piece of rock, like a mountaintop, and as we were standing there, this team, then people were calling out and were saying, by what authority do you do these things? That was said of Jesus when the priests were accusing him. How, how, why do you think you can do these things that you say you're doing? And so I heard those words that were questioning and maybe even a little accusing. By what authority are you doing these things? And before... I could give an answer, or any of us could give an answer. The mountain started to rise and was lifted up higher and higher and higher into the manifested glory of God. And then, as we were surrounded by the glory of God, we had no need to try to attempt an answer. By what authority can we bring the move of the Spirit? By what authority can we help bring God on the scene? It's when we are carriers of the anointing, and even by God's grace, the, un the glory of God. As we arise and shine, it says, nations shall come to the brightness of your rising. God wants His church and the Filipino church and Vietnam, Indonesia, okay, but right now it's 97% Filipino. God wants the Philippine church to be able to arise and shine and the glory of the Lord to be upon you that the nations shall come to the brightness of your rising. And we've got a couple of nations that are coming, that are sitting here right now, that are receiving something from God that you are helping to bring down to the earth. As we enter deeper into God's presence, the nations are hungry for the reality of what Christianity is supposed to be and what Christianity will be at the end because better is the end of something than the beginning, the scripture says. And the beginning of the church was filled with power and glory and we're going to see much more in these last days. So we want to learn how to press in that God will reveal himself. 
that God will move through our lives, through our ministries, that we won't have to explain or make excuses or, or uh, be questioned or attacked for what we do. But if God is moving among us, we need never defend our ministry. God will show himself as the one working and moving through your life and through our lives. Hallelujah! Amen. So we want to learn the imagery of Moses' tabernacle of drawing closer and closer to God and into his very glory. Now, a third imagery used in the Bible that helps explain how we can draw nearer to God and, 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 and receive more of his anointing. Number three in your notes is learning to be standing when God appears. Now, we can understand this starting from Malachi chapter 3, verse 2 and 3, where it says about the second coming, who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Now this is speaking most specifically about the second coming of Christ, but prophecies often have multiple fulfillment. Before the spirit and power of Elijah will come at the second, before the second coming, we know the spirit and power of Elijah came at the first coming. And when Jesus came into his temple, not everyone could stand. He came and overthrew the money uh, tables and, and with a whip drove out those that bought and sold. Not everyone could stand when he appeared in his holiness and in his anger. But this can also apply to us when the Lord wants to come visit us by his spirit. When he wants to come in revival power into our midst. Who can endure when he comes in his power? I can remember one service we had here at ZMI when God's power was very strong, especially right at the pulpit. And right in the middle of the song service, the song leader just whoo, fell over on the floor and couldn't lead songs anymore. was just out. And so my wife called for another song leader. And they came up. And they led for a little bit, and, and then they fell over. And then we called for a third person. They were scared to even get close to the pulpit because the power of God was so strong. Who can stand when he appears? When Solomon's temple was consecrated and the glory of the Lord filled the temple, it said the priests could not stand and minister. They were slain in the spirit, out. But the question for the last days is who shall stand when he appears? And the reason is those that can stand before the Lord are those that can be channels of his word and of his power. If you're out on the floor, knocked out, you're not ministering. You're greatly blessed. But you're not ministry anymore. You're out for the count, okay? But it says of Elijah in 1 Kings 17, verse 1, he stood before King Ahab and said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, there will be no rain or dew in all the nation until I say otherwise. Until Elijah released the rain again, he stood before the Lord. He had the authority of God. He was not afraid of standing before the throne of King Ahab because he stood before the throne of the King of Kings. And it says about him and Moses in Revelation 11 verse 4, These 
are the two witnesses that stand before the Lord of the whole earth. When we can stand in the power and glory of God and be a channel and a spokesman for God, then God will be able to freely move through your life and through us. Jesus said in John chapter 7, verse 24, about John the Baptist, he said to the people, what did you go out to the Jordan River to see? A man dressed in royal robes? No, John wasn't a fancy man. He wasn't royalty or rich. He wore very, very simple, poor clothes. Jesus said, what did you go out to see? A reed shaken by the wind? And when the wind blows, reeds will shake. Did the people go out to the River Jordan to see a man empowered by God? Right? And, and you couldn't even understand what he said because he was felt such power that, you know, you couldn't even understand half the words. Has that ever happened to you? It's happened to me, okay? God doesn't want us to be overwhelmed by his power. He wants us to be able to receive that same amount of power and not short circuit, not be overwhelmed, but receive it and be filled as a reservoir with it and be able to release it to the people we minister to. I worked for an evangelist that had fasted and prayed for 40 days. No food of any kind for 40 days. Only drank water. And after that 40 days, God anointed him with a very powerful anointing upon his life and ministry. And for the season that he carried that power upon him, we would have services and he would call for people to be prayed for and people would calm down and he'd lay hands on them and they'd fall over slain and usually healed. But the power of God was so great upon him that there were people that did not get all the way to have him lay hands. They just got all, they got near and they fell over. And there were even people from the back and they were getting closer to him they were still meters away, and the power of God was more than they could handle, and they fall over in the aisle. But he was standing there with the full anointing on him, standing and ministering. And so it's wonderful when we are overwhelmed by God's power, when God short circuits us beyond what we can contain, and you might short circuit with crying or laughing or shaking or falling over. Uh, we, you know, if, you, if, if 10 of us stuck our fingers in an electric plot, a socket, 10 of us would react in different ways, okay? <laughs> when it's more power than you can handle. You know, some people might scream, some might cry, some might fall over, but you know, you can't handle that much power. But God wants us to learn how to handle all of the power he wants to release in these last days, that we can be channels of that anointing, carriers of greater anointing. And so when we wait in God's presence, there are times that we can feel uh, uh, overwhelmed more than we're used to. Uh, and and, and we, we just can't contain more of the anointing. That's when we ask God to enlarge our heart. That's when we say, Lord, oh, oh, oh this, this is stretching my heart. This is even uncomfortable. I, I'm not used to so much of the Holy Spirit. But, Lord, I, I'm trying to open my heart. Come in your strength and your power. Fill me to more and more as we wait upon God. We don't want to be reeds shaken by the wind. My wife and I once helped lead a Bible school in Palawan back 33 years ago. And there was one sister that when she really got filled with the anointing, she, she didn't know how to release or express it. She didn't know what to do when she really felt the power of God. So what she did was she opened her mouth and she went, oh! and, 
my wife and I, quietly, in private, we nicknamed her Sister Teapot. Okay? You know, when the water boils, the teapot sings. Okay? And, and, and we really felt that she did this uh, when there was a real anointing upon her. But scripturally, you don't read anywhere that, you know, when the anointing falls upon you, you should be Sister Teapot, okay? It is not a manifestation that releases a blessing. So we pray and we felt that when she had that anointing, it was the spirit of prophecy. And the correct way that she should channel and release it was through prophesying, not through, ooh, having the highest, <laughs> the highest note in the, in the sanctuary, okay? And she learned how to channel that anointing and not just be overwhelmed and do something that was distracting rather than edifying. And so if you know a sister teapot or, or a, a brother shaker, you know, And so we want to learn when the power of God increasingly comes upon us that we don't do things that are distracting, but we learn how to absorb, soak in, get our reservoir filled with more and more of God's anointing and power in quietness, becoming reservoirs of the anointing. And then afterwards, we can be channels of that anointing. So we want to learn how to stand when he appears. If you're slain in the spirit and you're out, great, hallelujah. That's a blessing to you, but you can't bless others when you're out on the floor. But if you learn to receive that anointing and keep it and carry it, then you will be able to impart it to others. We understand? Okay, number four, imagery in the scriptures to teach us. Waiting on God, how to receive more and more of the anointing. In David's tabernacle, we have two psalms that he wrote in which he teaches us that more holiness brings more abiding with God. We get deeper and deeper into his presence. We abide in his presence with the more holiness developed in our lives. And so let's first look in Psalm 24. And in Psalm 24, verse 3, there is a question David wrote. He said, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who can stand in his holy place? So then there is the answer to this. The answer to who will qualify to ascend up into the holy hill of Zion. Ascend up to where God's manifested presence was. As David had placed the ark of God's presence in his tabernacle. As, as God's power and glory was revealed there. Who has the privilege of ascending up and visiting the presence and power of God? And the answer we are given starting in verse 4, he who, number one, has clean hands, number two, a pure heart, number three, not lifted up his soul to an idol, number four, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord. So four requirements of holiness listed here for someone to qualify to ascend up into God's holy hill, to ascend up into the manifested presence of God. And we want to be those that can ascend up in our times of worship and prayer and we feel we are entering into God's presence. That's wonderful. But there's something much more wonderful. In Psalm 15, we are taught a further lesson where in verse 1 it says, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell 
in your holy hill. Going up to visit God in his holy hill is wonderful, but it's much more wonderful to live with God on the top of the holy hill. It's wonderful in a good worship service to ascend up to a place where we sense God's spirit, but it's more wonderful if 24-7 you can learn to walk with to carry, to abide in the presence of the Lord, resting upon you, stirring in your heart. You're abiding, you're living with God's uh, presence revealed in and through you. That is much more wonderful. So when you leave here, do you the next morning wake up and still feel God's presence? Wonderful. How about a week after seminar? Are we still abiding in God's presence? God wants to teach us not just to ascend up to meet with God, but to live seated with Christ in heavenly places. But the difference in Psalm 15, if we want to dwell on the holy hill, if we want to abide in God's glory and presence, the requirements, starting in verse 2, he who, number one, walks uprightly, number two, works righteousness, number three, speaks the truth, number four, does not backbite, number five, does no evil to his neighbor, number six, does not take up a reproach, number uh, seven, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, number eight, but he honors those that fear the Lord, uh, uh, number nine, he swears to his own chick hurt, Number 10, does not put out his money to usury. Number 11, does not take a bribe against the innocent. 11 requirements of holiness if we want to abide on God's holy hill. Now, if we only want to go up to visit God's holy hill, only four requirements of holiness in our life. But if we want to live in God's holy hill, and abide in his presence, then there are 11 requirements. And so this teaches us, the more we want to live in the presence of God, the more we want the Holy Spirit to dwell in power upon us, resting on us, flowing through us. If we want the Holy Spirit to abide, he is the Holy Spirit. And for the Holy Spirit to remain, the Holy Spirit wants a holy temple to live in. No, you're not. You are the temple of the Lord. And we are to be holy as he is holy. If we are not holy, if we are defiled, then God can judge us. God will not uh, perhaps abide in his temple. But as we seek to purify ourselves, and walk more righteously, with more victory, with more purity in our life, then we will find that we will not just visit God's presence, we will learn to abide in God's presence. So we'll be able to say, like David, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You don't have to wait till you get to heaven, okay? We can have on earth as it is in heaven. If his will is done, if we build holiness in our life, we can not just visit, we can abide in God's presence in greater and greater ways. And God wants to purify us more and more. There was a time I was waiting on the Lord and I was just feeling more and more of God's manifested presence and power. And as, as I felt the Holy Spirit trying to sink in and, and get into the cracks and, and, and get deeper into my heart, there was resistance. And, oh, Lord, oh, I want to open my heart fully. I, I want to, to be completely filled. And, and as I'm asking God, fill me, Lord, take away the hindrances, then God gave me a vision. And in that vision, I saw my heart, as it were, a shelf of rows. And on those rows, there were 
different things. They were idols in my heart. I didn't know exactly what the idols were. Maybe it was an idol of loving praise of people, or maybe it was an idol of uh, seeking success, an idol of pride. I, I, I didn't know the names of the idols, but, but there were a number of idols there. And as I opened my heart to the incoming of the Holy Spirit, the power of God came and swept away so many of the idols. And oh, my heart felt so clean. I felt so pure. And oh, my heart was free to, to have so much more of the anointing. But as I looked at the continuing vision, there were still two or three idols that had not yet been swept away. And yet, I felt so much more pure, so much more able to just enjoy the, the, the presence of God. As God wants to more and more work deeper in our hearts, cleanse us and purify us so we will not just ascend and meet with God and feel God's presence for a short while while we're praying or while we're in church and afterwards we do not sense God's manifest presence. No, God doesn't want us just to visit him. He wants us to live with him. Amen. Who shall abide on your holy hill? More requirements of purification of holiness. So let's learn to come closer into God's presence, be cleansed, and be ready to be able to dwell with the Holy Spirit abiding in our hearts. Now, these are four imageries from the Bible that can teach us how to draw near into God's presence and abide in more of His power, more of His manifested presence and glory. But number five in your notes, we want to just close with the last section of practical suggestions for a time of waiting on God. You can do this when you're alone. Just open your heart to God and spend time seeking His presence when you're in His presence. Just opening your heart to more and more of His Spirit. But specifically, tonight, we are not going to have any preaching Tonight, we're just going to spend time together waiting on the Lord, opening our hearts to the Lord and inviting Him to send more and more of His presence, more and more of His power and glory. To those of you here who have graduated from the Bible school here, you know on Thursday nights, we just spend the evening just waiting on God, just seeking to get closer to God, feel more of His Spirit. And that's what we'll basically do tonight. It's a time when we're not seeking to minister to people. No preaching, no prayer, no laying on of hands. We're not interested in prophesying or doing something uh, on the horizontal level of ministry. But we want to develop our vertical relationship of each of us with God, learning how to wait in His presence. Rise up with eagle wings. Go to the holy place, if God permits, even into the holy of holies. And so, practical suggestions. First of all, in Psalm 52, verse 9, we are exhorted, in the presence of your saints, I will wait on your name, for it is good. So tonight, while we're all gathered together if the, as the saints of the Lord, we will wait on the name of the Lord. We will wait for his presence. This is good. It's good for us to seek the Lord. And practical suggestions, number A, gather in a quiet place to look to God. If you're house is right next to a loud disco club at night, it might be a little more difficult to meet the presence of the Lord, okay? But try to gather in a quiet place where you don't have distractions around you, where you can shut the door of, uh, in your house to a quiet room where the TV isn't blah, 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 okay? 
where you're alone in a quiet place with God. The scriptures say, like David seeking the Lord, in God's sanctuary, one thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. When we gather together tonight, what do we want to do? Love God more. See Him more clearly. Love Him more dearly. Just spend time drawing closer to the Lord, seeing Him more. And as the psalmist said in Psalm 130, verse 6, My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. Yes, more than those who watch for the morning. A night watchman is waiting for the morning to come. His job will be over. His, his duty will be done. And they wait in long till they can go sleep or eat and do other things. But we want to watch not for the morning. We want to watch for the coming of the presence of God. We want to watch for the coming, the visitation of God among us by His Spirit, by His power. As Psalm 46 verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Not the workings of man, but enter in to the working, the revealing, the manifestation, the coming of our God. And so as we want to gather together to seek the Lord, to wait upon the Lord, number B, at the gathering, whether you're alone at home at night or tonight as we're gathered, in the gathering, if you're sitting there and your heart is not yet in contact with God's presence, you might want to focus your heart and mind by maybe quietly thanking and praising God. Psalm 100 verse 4 says, We enter his gates with thanksgiving, enter his courts with praise. So if you're not sure that you sense God's manifested presence or want to enter in deeper, you might just quietly just say, Lord, I love you. Lord, I'm so thankful I can be here. I love you, Lord. And just quietly lift your heart in thanksgiving and praise to God. Don't do it loud to distract the person next to you. They're trying to focus their heart on God. And while they're trying to focus their heart on God, they don't want the person next to them. Oh, God! Let's quietly together lift our hearts to the Lord. Quietly maybe pray, speak in tongues. Because 1 Corinthians 14, 4 says, He that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself. We build up our spirit. We recharge our spiritual batteries. Or the imagery we heard today is we fill our reservoir. Speaking in tongues stirs up the anointing within us. Another way that we can focus our heart on more of God's presence is if we have anointed music being played. Have gentle music being played in the background. And if you hear a song that just is lifting your heart to God, you have a musician that's flowing in the anointing, then you can just tune into the anointing flowing through that music. So we'll start this evening with no activity except everybody sits. And while you sit, if you want to quietly pray, speak in tongues, sing it. If you want to read your Bible to focus on the Lord, that's great. But we'll also have Pastor Dick playing on the keyboard worshipful music just to help tune our hearts to the flow of the spirit as he tunes in to the flow of the anointing we can tune in through his worship in second kings chapter 3 verse 15 
There was a time when they called for the prophet Elijah on the battlefield and asked him for a prophecy. Now, if you have a gift of prophecy, you know sometimes it's hard to stir it up. And you know, a good anointed worship service really helps you, do, you know, prophesy. But who has ever prophesied on a battlefield? That's not a very easy place to be spiritual, right? And so when Elijah was asked to prophesy by the kings, he said, bring me a musician. And it says there in chapter 3, verse 15, as the musician started to play, the hand of the Lord came down upon Elijah, and he could prophesy. The musician brought the move of the Spirit to Elijah's heart. So while we're quiet, and you can be quietly seeking God, praying, reading your Bible, speaking in tongues, thanking the Lord, you can also be listening to the flow of anointing that will come through Pastor Dick's worship. And after a season, we might all start singing some of those songs. Also in your notes, another way we can focus ourselves on God's presence is remember former experiences you've had. Times in the past, you had a real experience in God's presence. You, you, you felt the power of God touch you, or you felt a wonderful anointing in a service, or maybe you had a glimpse of the glory of the Lord, and, and, and you just remember that wonderful experience. Then, as you're waiting on God, if you want to remember the ways that you've met with God in power in the past, that remembrance, as you remember, oh, the presence of God was so real. Oh, this is how I met with God. As we think of it, as we tune our hearts to it, then we can be blessed by the remembrance. We can, we can have some of the afterglow. We can remember what it's like. And that can help to bring us in to the moving of the Spirit. David said in Psalm 63, O oh God, earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and glory. So while David was in the wilderness, probably hiding in a cave, as he was seeking the Lord, he could remember the times. He was in the house of God. He met with the presence of God. And remembering those wonderful experiences of the past helped remind him and bring him into the presence of God when he was in a dry and thirsty place. So if you're in a dry season and you haven't been meeting God like normally, remember the times you have met with God in the most power. And as you tune your heart to remember and experience that and love it and enter in again, that can help tune your heart to afresh. Behold God's power and glory. So these are all things that we can do to begin to enter more and more into God's presence. Okay, tuning our hearts to the presence of God, blowing like a wind, lifting us higher on eagle wings as we wait on the Lord. So number C, when we sense God's presence starting to move, starting to be manifested, then we want to learn to turn our hearts into the revelation of God's presence. We feel the Holy Spirit coming stronger and stronger, blowing into our heart, lifting us up. Turn your face to the blowing of the wind. Open your heart to more and more of God's presence as we spend time waiting upon the Lord. And number D, if God convicts you of anything that's blocking you from drawing closer to God, confess your sin, ask God for help, and say, Lord, by your grace, I'm, I'm going to uh, change what movies I watch. I'm going to change and start my Bible, my day reading the Bible, whatever, whatever God might realign. Whatever God might show you needs to be changed. Then say, God, by your grace, I'll, I'll have that changed in my life. And then 
once you've confessed your weakness or fault or sin, then go on. Don't be distracted. Don't just let the enemy throw a little fiery dart into your mind of something bad, something where you missed God. And then, oh, I missed God 17 years ago. Oh, I feel so bad. Okay? No. Leaving behind the things of the past and pressing on to what is ahead. Let's run for God. Let's focus on his best. Don't be distracted. Don't be deflected. Seek for more of God tonight. And every time that you spend time in God's presence, waiting upon him, if we need to repent, ask God to change something, deal with it quick, and then move on into God's goodness and love and presence. And number E, the Holy Spirit may move everyone into being guided in a certain direction. There are times that everyone might perhaps start to pray a little more loudly and we're being moved in prayer together. Or there are times when Pastor Dick is playing the keyboard where we might just feel it's time to start singing. Uh, and uh, don't sing a solo. Okay, We don't want to distract people around us. But if everybody starts to sing, then join in. Blend in with a symphony and let the Holy Spirit blend our hearts and our voices in worship to God. Okay? So, however God leads us tonight or in times when you are seeking God in a group, then just seek together to flow in God. In 1 Corinthians 14, 33, it says, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. And if the Holy Spirit is moving, it will not be confusion where one person is loudly speaking in tongues and someone else is shaking. Oh, this is more of God than I can control. And someone else is rolling on the floor and someone else is, you know, doing something else. No. If God is collectively moving us closer and closer to his presence, let's do it together in unity. Behold how good and pleasant it is when the brethren are in unity. It's like the oil that's coming down to anoint, in Psalm 133, the high priest, for us to anoint the body of Christ. That we sense the anointing coming down when we are together flowing in unity. So look for Pastor Dick. When we have a song leader, look for the song leader. Look for those that, that are uh, maybe more skilled or mature that may uh, have something to suggest as a, as a way to further flow uh, in the evening's uh, service. And then if uh, we're all flowing together, we're just going to spend time meeting with God tonight. If you have a schedule and you really need to leave at any certain time, you're welcome to leave any time. But if you're hungry for more of God, you're, willing to, you're welcome to stay as long as you want. Okay? So let's just be led of the Lord. But if you have time requirements, you've got to get somewhere, you've, uh, it's no problem. The Lord bless you. You just quietly slip out. Quietly go to your vehicle. Don't, uh, 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 don't honk your horn. Okay. Just as quiet as you can. Just leave. And the, everybody that has the extra time that wants to will just enjoy more of God. Now, we might go till 9 o'clock or 10 or 11. If we really feel God move, we'll just ignore the clock, throw it away, and we'll just enjoy the Lord. Okay. I am continually challenged by something that was spoken about the Welsh Revival back a century ago. Perhaps the most powerful revival 
that ever came that made a national transformation. And what people in the revival said was every evening the Spirit of God would draw all the people to come to the churches. They didn't have preaching. They'd wait on the Lord. They'd be moved to pray, moved to worship, and they'd just flow with the Spirit. And people that were in the center of that revival said, the services started in all the churches. All the churches were open. People just went to all the churches and started about 6 o'clock at night every evening. Services started at 6. And then the flesh went home at midnight. And the glory would fall about 3 in the morning. This happened night after night. For over six months, those that waited upon the Lord and pressed Him could get saved in the first part of the service, could get a great blessing of God and go home. Maybe they need sleep. But those that pressed into God to where God's Shekinah, visible glory of God, was revealed night after night, it would come about three in the morning. And that challenges me. And I say, Lord, I don't want to be a, a 9 o'clock saint. You know, I don't even want to be a 12 o'clock saint. If you want to reveal your manifested glory, I want to be a 3 o'clock saint. I want to press in for all of God. And if God doesn't want to do that, and we're not in the Welsh Revival tonight, then we don't have to stay till 3 o'clock, okay? <laughs> but it's the intent of our heart. Will we press in for all that God wants to give us? And maybe he'll have us end early so everyone can get full sleep and be ready for a full day tomorrow. We'll just try to be sensitive to what God wants. But tonight, about 6.30, we will have no formal opening. Pastor Dick will just be playing on the keyboard. We invite you to find a chair you can open your Bible if you want and read a little. Don't talk to other people. It will not be time for fellowship with people. It's time for fellowship with God, okay? Please don't talk with anyone in the sanctuary. But let's just spend time seeing how deep and deeper and deeper we can enter into God's presence. How much higher and higher on eagle's wings we can can be lifted okay so we'll have an hour break for supper and then come back about 6 30 and just be quiet before the Lord but seek that your reservoir your vessel your heart will be filled with more and more of God's presence thank you God bless you Amen.